And the title is from verse 42 of John's uh, first chapter. He brought him to Jesus. People, this is, this, you know, I always have a, a, a week to meditate on, on the, I don't know why we're having such Is that hand mic? That's all. Okay. Okay. Okay, hopefully no more ringing, otherwise I just grab another mic. Or I speak without a mic. Okay. I work without a net. Okay. Um, he brought him to Jesus. We're going to see how the early disciples evangelized. That's a fancy word. We're just saying bringing people to Christ. Some of us in here have probably never brought anybody to Jesus. I'm not, don't raise your hand or anything like that. I want the, the Spirit to speak to us today because when Jesus came, He came to change the world. He was the answer and is the answer and He began to change the world through unremarkable men. These were not men with halos. These were not men with great knowledge. These were not men of great importance. They were everyday, garden variety men. And we see that they did change the world by simply bringing people to Jesus. And we're going to talk about this today. But we've had other people in history also determined to change the world. Karl Marx. You know, we've had demonic influence. The father of communism. He said this, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. And the way he did that with communism was the recruiters of communism expected complete devotion from the followers toward the cause. And we see how that worked because communism spread like wildfire across Europe and Asia and Africa for an evil cause. We see it with cults. It's amazing how the enemy can work in the hearts of one person and affect millions of people. Charles Taze Russell, the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, perverted the message of Jesus, but had that same philosophy of demanding complete devotion from the followers. And if you ever see Jehovah's Witnesses, because people, I've had them come to my door, and I cannot believe the audacity of them that come back again and again. They, they know I'm a Christian pastor, and yet they come knocking, and they come after, and Brigham Young, uh, Joseph Smith's followers, the same way. A, a, a true Mormon, a true LDS uh, follower is completely devoted to the cause. And Jesus is not in the center. So we have these uh, false religions and, and false philosophies and false ways. And we always see that they have a beautiful way of keeping Christ out of it. Communism, what did they do? They, they closed the churches. They keep people, they, they get rid of the Bibles. They don't want the light of Christ there. And in, in a more insidious way, uh, the cults do the same thing. They just change who Jesus is, but they keep all the form there. And it's to our shame that these people have done a better job at spreading falsehoods than we who have the truth have done. The good news, we have everything in Jesus. I shared yesterday that uh, on the uh, day of the high satanic holidays, Halloween, my sister called and said, do you want to watch Savannah and watch Georgia, uh, Savannah's daughter, and Grayson trot around and beg from people to take their candy. <laughs> and of course we did. We wanted to go and see these little kids, and so they had their little, they were all dressed as the Peppa Pig. You know, the, you ever hear of Peppa Pig? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a big thing with little kids. Oh yeah, you would know, of course. Right? So they were all dressed like the Peppa Pig family, and uh, trotting around the neighborhood, and little George was running up house to house, and every time she would, uh, so every so many houses, somebody would be out by the table, maybe in their driveway or at the door, and uh, 
it was just sweet that she, she'd get the candy. Of course, her parents would say, say thank you. And then she would come out holding this up in the, every single house announcing, well, ah, I got you. <laughs> but I say that to say afterward, I, uh, we went for pizza. <laughs> and my, it was a place where my sister frequents. And she introduced us to a, a Mexican lady who was about 60 years old. And the woman, uh, in her broken English, was explaining that her son had come up here from Mexico City. They're a Catholic. And he found Jesus. And then she came up. And she found Jesus. And the expression on her face, it was such glory as she said, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. The best thing. And people... It's the best thing that ever happened to you or to me. Amen. How can we keep this to ourselves? We're going to see today how Jesus took ordinary people like you and like me who followed him, not perfectly, at least at first, but wholeheartedly and with complete devotion and did indeed do what Jesus called you and me and they to do. Turn the world upside down. Let's pray. Father, as we come to these scriptures today, I pray, Lord, you keep me right on target to what your spirit wants to say to your saints. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. John chapter 1, starting in verse 35. And may I say, Dan, you made a good cup of coffee. <laughs> Robust, full-bodied. <laughs> Verse 35. The next day... Now, uh, before we even go on, I want to say that as we're reading into John's first chapter, it reads like a diary. He tells us about four days. The first day, as we looked at last week, the leaders of the temple came to question John the Baptist, who are you? And he basically says, I'm just a voice, but the one you're looking for is right among you. He's about to be revealed. That was day one. The second day, he announces, he points to Jesus and says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The long-awaited Messiah, the long-awaited Christ is here. And now we're into the next day, day three, and then we're going to see another next day, day four. And this is where Jesus calls his first five disciples. And we're going to see a beautiful pattern of how Jesus calls us to follow him. So the next day, John, that's the baptizer, was there with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. So, we see these two disciples and we find out that they are Andrew and John the writer of this gospel. And John the Baptist points at Jesus and announces who he is and they begin to follow him. And in that day, people literally followed their teachers. Socrates or Aristotle, they literally Walk, they were Jesus was walking along and they literally went after him. And that's what they did with teachers in that day. Because you you if you believe in something someone was saying, you wanted to see how they lived it out. And you know, you think about that. And I am a backslidden weight watcher. I won't turn to the side or you'll <laughs> I'll try. Stand with my stomach in, but <laughs> But you know, you, you go to Weight Watchers and they've got an instructor in the front of the room that everybody you know, follows because they're usually someone who's lost a nice, you know, a solid amount of weight, like 60 pounds or 50 pounds, and they show the before picture. So if you're going to Weight Watchers, 
And uh, I go to a class where this lady, Kelly, leads it. But she went on vacation for a couple of weeks and came back 20 pounds heavier. Oh. No, she didn't, but I said if. Oh. Oh. <laughs> if she did. <laughs> You know, you would think, I don't know if I really want to listen to her anymore because apparently she's not practicing what she preaches. So John and Andrew, they, they want to follow Jesus because they want to see who he is, what he did. And Jesus simply says, come and see. And every one of us who has come to follow Jesus can remember that time in their life where this radical change took place. Mm -hmm. Now for some of us, we know exactly, some people remember the exact date, mm -hmm. the time, you know, all those things. Somebody like me, I remember the exact <laughs> details of what was going on. It was in the summer of 1973. It was either June or July. I don't know the exact date, but I remember it like it was yesterday. Someone like Stephanie and some of you others, Adele was mentioning the other day, it was over a period of time. Stephanie had some people, some kids, uh, she was in a little band that played at Knott's Berry Farm, and these uh, college kids witnessed to her. They were Christians. And over time, she doesn't remember exactly where or when, but she came to faith. And it's radical. I don't care if you remember the exact minute or not. And the testimonies always have the same pattern. Truth is presented. Here's Jesus. He walks along. He's not wearing the halo, but John says, Behold the Lamb of God. And his, these two disciples say, What? And then they begin to follow him. So there's the second thing that happens after truth is presented. And we all know, if we think of our own testimonies, who was talking to us? What did we see? What entered our ear? And then there's an initial reaction to it. And then the decision comes to believe and to follow. And regardless of how we come to Christ, and it's just as individual as our fingertips because that's the way God designed us. And He has a, a way of drawing each one of us that He knows is tailor-made for us. Regardless of how it happens, that pattern is the same. Truth is presented. There's an initial reaction. And then we make a decision to follow and to believe. So the verses we just read, these are the testimonies of John and of Andrew and uh, this following Jesus they are following him and then they spend the day with him it says the 10th hour on in Jewish time that day that was four in the afternoon can you imagine if you had that opportunity Jesus is here in the flesh you ever imagine what would it be like to really just be with Jesus Physically, you know, where you could just talk to him. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they at four in the afternoon. They followed him and they spent the whole late afternoon and the evening with him. And they stayed overnight with him. And they got up in the morning, different people. We sang this morning that, that great old hymn. Why churches do away with, with hymns like this, I'll never know. Because that is good music, beautiful lyric. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I'm his own. Yeah. And I want to tell you something, people. Is this just poetry? No. It's reality in the Christian life. Yeah. I've shared other times. I always encourage you to pray, and to walk, take prayer walks. Stephanie and I yeah. do that every Sunday morning. And a number of times of the week, we take a walk, we hold hands, and we talk to Jesus. We're walking with Jesus. We're talking with Jesus. It's, it's real stuff. I often, when I pray, I go, I'll go by myself. I'll go into our backyard and I walk around and I pray. Sometimes I will sit. Sometimes I, I have a hard time sitting on the floor of the living room to pray because Pumpkin thinks that it's playtime if I get on the floor. So he's killed that for me. But that walking with him and talking with him and and. Again, we think of these disciples, wow, what would it be like to be with Jesus and see what he did? We have their testimonies. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we can read, what did Jesus do? What did he say? That's why the reading of the word is so important, because that reality of who he is, is real stuff, people. Real stuff. So, verse 40, Andrew, 
Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did. Everybody say, the first thing. The first thing. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. That is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Hence the title. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. So as soon as John recognizes who Jesus is, he runs and gets his brother. He brought him to Jesus. People, this is evidence that you've had an encounter with the living Christ when you can't keep it to yourself. You can't keep your yap shut. I'm telling you, you can't keep your mouth shut if you really met Jesus. It's too good. And people say, well, I'm not good at talking about religious things. I'm not, I'm not good at talking about Jesus. Or I don't know much scripture. Or I don't know a technique. Andrew was with Jesus. How long? How long was his testimony? Four o'clock the other afternoon. It's morning the next day. What do you think he knew about Jesus? Just enough. How many scriptures did he have to quote? Nothing. He didn't have to know anything. We talk about movies. People say, oh, I'm not good at... Oh. Well, I don't buy that. <laughs> because I hear people all the time. We talk about places we like to eat. We talk about things we like to do. Things we're enthused about. If we're enthused about Jesus, if we really met Him, we can't keep it to ourselves. And if we are, then we have to ask why. Either we're lazy. You know, the Bible has a good word for that. Sloth. Lying around. You know. Lying on the couch. Or, we don't want to face consequences. What will people think of me? What will they say? They're going to think I'm some sort of crackpot. You know? There's all kinds of excuses. Summer of 73, when I was just going about my life and I'm visiting this friend. I had a non-kosher relationship with this friend. That's what is making, that's what Jesus is all about. Being in the non-kosher places. We'll see in a little bit, Nathaniel, when Philip says, Jesus of Nazareth, you've got to meet him, Jesus of Nazareth. And, and Nathaniel says, Nazareth, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Jesus of Nazareth sounds so holy to us. But, and I've explained before that there was a Roman outpost right near Nazareth and where there are young Pagan, bored soldiers, there is sin. So the city was associated with sin, and it was miles away from the religious capital, Jerusalem. And so it was a no account town. It was filled with sin. And Jesus grew up there. And that is who Jesus is. He lives for the sinful. He was sinless, but he lived among the sinful. And what is the gospel saying? What does the Bible say? Where sin abounds, Grace abounds all the more. So there I am visiting this friend. And it just so happens that that night, we go into his kitchen and have a cup of tea, and his mother is talking about Jesus. And I'd known this woman. I knew she was a religious fanatic. She did weird things. She went to church Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, and that was like ridiculous. So I didn't pay much attention to her, until I sat in that kitchen and heard her in another room witnessing to her older son and daughter-in-law and saying, Jesus is coming back. And she could have said anything about Jesus. It didn't matter what she said, but the Holy Spirit used that message for my heart. And I'll tell you, that began, that Sunday night began a work. 
Because when I went home, I, that's all I could think about. I was consumed. God took that little bit of a seed from what that woman said, witnessing to somebody else. She was trying to bring them to Jesus. But the Holy Spirit used that seed to bring me to Jesus. So not knowing a thing about who this Jesus is, but I grew up in church and Sunday school and heard the hymns and all of these things, but we didn't quite get it. And now we're talking at the dinner table and I'm telling my parents, Mrs. Engel says Jesus is coming back. And my dad's poo-pooing it. Oh, we remember this holy roller church. And we used to sit outside and laugh at them, all the noise that was going on inside that church. And my mother is going, I think she could be right. <laughs> the faithfulness of someone who brings somebody to Jesus, it, it began a transformation in the Walker family. And it's, I, it consumed me for days until finally I picked up the phone. I would go in and talk to my 18-year-old <laughs> sister and because everybody else would be in bed. And I, we couldn't figure this out. But what happens after death? We didn't know anybody who died. Our grandparents were all living. No. I wonder what happens, you know. And I'd go back to my bedroom and, and all I could think of was how big, when we had that conference yesterday, the God of the universe, how big God was. This is who I was dealing with. And I finally called this woman and said, can we come in and talk with you? I heard you say, Jesus is coming back. And I just thought, she'll answer a question or two, we'll go home, mm -hmm. life will go on. Mm -hmm. And that night it was on my face on her living room floor mm -hmm. in tears, meeting Jesus. Amen. I'm just going to tell you, from that summer of 1973, life has never been the same. It didn't make me perfect. I still had struggles. I had issues the Lord had to work on. I had no idea how much mess was in my life. But I couldn't shut up about Jesus. Because this is real. I met Jesus. So I began immediately telling people, couldn't take, keep our mouths shut. Had to tell the grandparents. Had them over for lunch a couple weeks later. Now, what did I know about Scripture? Very little. Did I have any kind of long walk with Jesus? No. I just told them we met Jesus. That's what we did. We had four of our grandparents sitting at a lunch table. Had the woman that brought us because we figured she, she can talk more. You know. And that's what happens. You can't keep it shut up. And that's what Andrew does. He runs and he gets Peter. And when Peter comes into the presence of Jesus, Jesus looks right at him and he says, I already know your name. It's Simon. Simon means hearing. How appropriate. He was hearing Jesus. For the next three years, he'd hear Jesus. But Jesus said, your name is hearing, but I'm changing it to the rock, to Peter. And we see this transformation in this man who's just like you and me, asks all the wrong questions, puts his foot in his mouth, time after time after time, he, we can relate to it. He asks all the things and says the things that most of us would want to say. And this transformation takes place. And this is the same thing Jesus does for every one of us. And that's why I say that this is no light matter when we meet Jesus because he changes our names. I don't care whether you look the same. It's like a building under new management. 2980, where we are, was a title company for years. Nothing wrong with a title company. We need that when we're buying a house. So they were here a number of years, and then they vacated. And then in came a telemarketing company, and they left in the middle of the night one time without paying their rent. And then the place sat empty. And then God brought us here. It's the same address outside. The building looks nearly the same on the outside, except our name over the door. But it's completely different operation going on here. A complete change. That's what Jesus does for you and for me. A new vision, a new plan, a new direction, and a new name. 1 Corinthians 5.17, we know this so well. Therefore, in other words, if Jesus is in your life, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things. How many things? Oh. All things become new. Isaiah 62.2 says this, The nations will see your righteousness, 
and all kings your glory, and you will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. He did it for Peter. He does it for each one of us. Even if your name on your checking account is still the same, you are a different person, people. John 43 says this. To pick up. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. So, Jesus is walking along. John points out, here's Messiah. His two disciples, Andrew and John, begin to follow him. They spend some time with him. Andrew goes and gets his brother Peter, and he brings him, we just saw, to Jesus. But, we read here, Jesus found Philip. Some of you may have seen the film Finding Nemo. <laughs> we could call it Finding Philip. You know, regardless of how somebody comes, whether a friend talked to you about Jesus, whether a family member, whether you were watching an evangelist on television, whether you were reading the Bible in a prison cell, it all happens the same way. The Lord finds you. We say, and we see the disciples saying, we found the Messiah. We often ask people, how did you find Jesus? It's really the wrong way of looking at it. Jesus finds you and he finds me. He seeks us out. John, Jesus said in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You know what a privilege that is? That we were drawn and thank God we responded? Yep. Let's look at Luke 15, starting in verse 3. Then Jesus <coughs> told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? There is a term, finds it. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. He goes home. And he calls his friends and neighbors together. And he says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you. Imagine how Jesus must have preached this. It was not, I can tell you right now, it was not in some monotone voice. I think Jesus could have been jumping up and down when he said, I tell you, though, in the same way, there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Jesus is saying that this who God is, who God is he goes after, he finds the lost, he puts that lost little sheep on his back, on his shoulders, and then throws a great big party. Verse 44, Philip found Nathanael. So, Jesus found Philip. <laughs> now Philip goes and finds Nathanael and told him, We found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And then that famous quote, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. So, again, what we're seeing, people, is when these men meet Jesus, they go and tell other people. They can't help themselves. There's been such a difference. You just can't help it. So, I think again, can anything good come from there? Before I was a Christian, maybe you can relate to this. I would go to the Free Methodist Church every now and then. We went to the Presbyterian Church where everything was quiet and orderly. And then I'd go to this Free Methodist Church and there were a lot of poor people. A lot of dominators. And it wasn't a fancy church. And uh, I remember thinking, this is not it. This isn't it. And then a few years later when I really met Jesus, I thought, that's, that's where I ended up. <laughs> right with all those poor losers. Because you know? <laughs> I recognized I need Jesus. <laughs> wow. Amen. So, can anything good come from there? And then we see this. Come and see, said Philip. See, we need to, to speak to more people and say, come and see. Yeah. 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 I, I can't tell you how to do that. There are various ways to deal with different people. Every individual is different. Mm. Every situation is different. But come on, come and see. Yeah. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said to him, 
Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. <laughs> then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than these. Mm -hmm. See, when Nathaniel approaches Jesus, just like with Peter, Jesus looks right into his soul. And that's the way it is with every single one of us. Jesus knows exactly who we are. And the scripture says that he has the hairs on our head counted. Mm -hmm. It's that intimate, that individual, that precise. And Jesus sees Nathaniel under a tree. And it's more than likely that Nathaniel was doing what the Talmud, which came later after Nathaniel, after Jesus, the Jewish book, the Talmud, which is a uh, Jewish writings of, of Jewish scholars. And the Talmud advised Jewish men to go under a tree once a day and study the scriptures. And that is more than likely what Nathaniel was doing at that time, studying the Old Testament prophets, looking at the prophecies about Messiah, and then he comes to the realization when he meets Jesus, it backs up what the scripture has been saying, and he says, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. 51. Then he added, Jesus is still speaking to Nathaniel. I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the, man, on the Son of Man. Where do we see angels up and down? Jacob's ladder. Exactly. Years earlier, that scoundrel Jacob running from home. He just cheated his brother out of the inheritance. And he's lying out in the wilderness with his head on a rock. That's symbolism, people. And he has a dream. And there's a ladder between these two separate realms, heaven and earth. And angels are coming and going and coming and going. And Jesus is telling everybody, go back to that dream because the ladder's here. The way from earth to heaven, I'm it. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you something. The majority of us, I'm sure, maybe all of us, I hope all of us, believe that Jesus is the only way between earth and heaven. The only way for men to be saved. Jesus said this about himself. And you know, sometimes we're not doing what the disciples are doing. And, and this speaks to every one of us. We should be very sensitive to the opportunities God gives us to bring people to Jesus. And I know that everyone in here, if we were outside and saw a building on fire and no one else was around, but, and we see people screaming from the higher floors, and we've got the one ladder that will rescue them, we would have no problem grabbing that ladder and running to that building and propping that ladder against the building and getting those people out safely. And Jesus is telling us it's just as true, in fact, even more important, that people are escaping the flames of hell and the devastation that the enemy does while people are living on earth. Just quickly. Again, I live with these, look at the scriptures and I think about the need of telling other people. We, we just see from this brief portion of Scripture how they need Jesus. He means so much to them that they have to go out and bring other people, bring other people, bring other people, bring other people. And I remember that so well in my early years. I was talking about talking with another pastor this week, and we are both talking about that zeal you have as a young Christian. He was a teenager, and he would be witnessing to kids at school. And... Again, after we talked to my grandparents, we started having neighbors and friends in. You know, and it's just so, it's, it's amazing what God can do with just that kind of faithfulness. And so maybe 12 or 13 neighbors would come. I think about one lady that, that was, that's still a friend, and her dad lived behind us on a farm, and he was an Episcopalian uh, priest. So, quote unquote, he knew the Bible. Mm -hmm. 
So she comes down to our house in the living room, and we're just telling them this little bit that we know about Jesus. And we're telling people they need to be born again, and we don't know much scripture or anything else. And then we had some coffee and some bun cake. And then everybody went home, and she always says she was driving to her house in the country where we live, one mile from our house, and she said, about halfway there, I just believe what you were saying. And the next day, she went up to her parents, and she said, I was at the walkers the night before, and they said that we had been born again, and that Jesus is coming back. And her dad said, oh, that's, Jesus is, he comes back when he comes into your heart. And you can't understand the Bible. The average person just can't understand that Bible. You need all kinds of books and all kinds of education. In other words, I'm the one that can tell you how to, how to live. And this man wasn't born again. Bless his heart, you know. But lives change whenever we are faithful to what God will do. Amen. Years later, that was in my 20s. Years later, when I was in my 40s, I'm at the Lutheran Church. I'm called there to lead worship. And I found people in that church that didn't have a relationship with Jesus. Wonderful people. But they didn't know Jesus. So I gathered a group of Lutherans that I knew did know Jesus in a living room. And I sat and gave my testimony. And I said how we used to have people come into our homes. And I said, you are aware in this church, you have people in this church that don't know Jesus. Mm -hmm. wow. And I said, I don't know what you Lutherans call it, but Jesus said, you must be born again. And he didn't say you have to be at this denomination or pray this way or do this this way. He said, you must be born again. And then we had coffee and cake with those Lutherans. It was a Saturday night, the very next day, one of the men came back, an older man of about 70. And he said to my sister, you know, I know I was kind of quiet when I left your house last night. We're in church the next day. He said, I know I was kind of quiet. But he said, I was thinking about what your brother said. And he said, I've loved Jesus all my life, but I never asked him into my heart. And when I went home, I asked Jesus into my heart. Amen. That's all because of a little bit of faithfulness. And some guts. Because you have to be prepared that maybe people will think differently about you. But I'll tell you something. This is what we're called to do. Yes. Back in the 90s. few more stories and then I'll say adios. <laughs> in the 90s, my sister was out somewhere publicly and a man came up to her. He said, is your, are you Kathy Walker? Her name is Kathy Walker Cook now, but... He said, she said, yes. He said, did you have an act with, with your brother? She said, yes. He said, well, you probably don't remember me, but I, 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 I was a musician, and I was here in the 70s, my wife and I, and one time you and your brother were witnessing to us at the Royal Inn Casino, wow. and we thought you two people were out of your minds. <laughs> said, five years later, we moved to Dallas, Texas, and we have to be friends with these people who took us to church, and I just want you to know that now we're Christians. And he said, I never forgot you and your brother. <laughs> yeah. Yes. What, what yeah. the Lord does. Yeah. Him giving out those yeah. tracks. Yep. He, he won't know until he gets to heaven what impact yeah. those tracks have made. But he's being faithful to what he feels yeah. God has yeah. called yeah. him to do. Yeah. I was going to a Sunday school class reunion. The woman who was my Sunday school teacher, her mother was the pillar of our church. She was the choir director. And when Stephanie and I got married 12 years ago, she flew out from Pennsylvania and was part of the wedding. Good friends. About a year later, we were going home in the fall, and she said, I want to have a Sunday school class reunion, and I want to show your wedding video to the class. Okay. But I determined, I thought, I'm going to witness to that Sunday school class because I haven't seen these people in 40 years, and if they're anything like me, just in church, they don't know the Lord. We go into that meeting, go into that house, and they're having ham barbecues and things that you eat in Pittsburgh. And the one girl, one of the ladies, we're all in our 50s. And this woman is talking about an episode of Grey's Anatomy. And it was filthy. And I'm thinking, I don't believe this. We're at a sensible class reunion and she's talking about some filthy situation. I'm in the right place because Mrs. Harper, our Sunday school teacher, is rolling over in her grave right now. Yeah. So we had our food. We went into Mary Jane's room where she was showing the video. We started to watch the video and I had them pause it at one point because the evening was getting late and I thought, I've got to tell these people about Jesus. I began to witness and tell them how I grown up in the Presbyterian church, went to a Presbyterian college, but met Jesus and the difference that made. And I got attacked. And there were people who were coming against me, several people. One of them was the hostess, the Sunday school teacher, ah, wow. and the choir director. Wow. Wow. You know, 
Really, Bill? Did that really happen? Did... So you know what? <laughs> I'm in a room with like 14 people stepping in and I'm giving this testimony and it's being disrupted and the hostess got so upset she started turning the TV back on. Oh, she wow. Was doing every, I mean, it was such an attack on the enemy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. And when we went to leave, she didn't even see us to the door. She was so kicked off. Oh, yeah. You done hey, well. People, they took stones for some of our predecessors. Yeah. I didn't get stoned, you know. And I mean that in more ways than one. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, you know what? I didn't get everything out that I wanted to say, but those people will not forget somebody who spoke passionately yeah. Yeah. about Jesus Christ. Amen. It'll haunt them. Yeah. Yeah. And they'll be responsible. So, I want to close with this. Again, you don't have to know much about Jesus to talk about Him. But we should all be burdened for the people, family yes. members, friends, people we run into around us that need to know Jesus. And begin praying. Start with prayer. Ask God, how can I reach this person? Let's close with this scripture. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Jesus instructs us, Therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. People, this morning I've taught you what Jesus tells us to do. I hope this stays with you through this week. Again, I don't want to put condemnation on you, but I want us to begin saying, God, how can I reach the people in my world? Yes. Christ, let's close. Father, we thank you for this message. We are so thankful for these examples of how the gospel is spread from one person to another. Lord, just like that old expression, it's one beggar telling another beggar where they can find bread. And so we see, Lord, Andrew going to Peter. Peter reaching people. Jesus finding Philip. Philip finding Nathaniel, bringing him to Jesus. Lord, we want to recognize the opportunities around us. You said that the fields are white for harvest. Give us eyes to see this, Lord, and give us boldness to speak in your name. We ask in that name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. And amen. Have a good week. <laughs>